Kia ora. Hello. Welcome to this week's episode of How to Improve Your Impression, Reenacting on a Budget. This video is intended to offer some tips to help newer reenactors on a tight budget with sourcing and maximizing resources so they can build an impression with a smaller outlay of money. On the whole, I must admit that, like playing in a band, I personally haven't found reenacting and living history to be a low budget hobby on the whole. There are a lot of specialist items required in order to build a convincing and useful impression. However, the pursuit of recreating history obviously does lend itself to making historical reproductions from scrounged, foraged and cheaply bought materials. In fact, as many seasoned reenactors will know, before there were numerous excellent suppliers of historical goods, this was more necessary to do. There was very little available in the way of specialised fabrics, footwear, fittings and so on. A reenactor or living historian often had to be somewhat of a polymath in order to put together a reasonable historical impression. And some concessions were made. Skills that have come in handy include fabric identification, sewing and pattern making, other specialised textile crafts, leatherworking, blacksmithing and metalworking, potting, woodworking, you name it. And this is, as we know, a huge part of being a reenactor. The key to successfully reenacting on the cheap is being opportunistic and having an excellent general knowledge of the material culture of the period you're reenacting. That way you can make the most of bargains and opportunities as they arise. You then don't need to take the time to deliberate over your purchase as you might otherwise. One purchase it's hard to go wrong with is books. Books, books, books. We have found so many great books secondhand for a fraction of the cost by scouring charity stores, book sales and secondhand bookstores. Some books are about the specific period we reenact, such as books about medieval material culture, books about medieval armour or armed conflicts, and some books are more general, such as books about needlework, or the general history of music, or the history of fashion through the ages, or such, which provide context or help you improve a skill set. You can also pick up hard copies of classic historical texts, such as Chaucer or the Decameron, for example. A fantastic resource for raw materials is suitable, that are suitable for reenacting is often, of course, charity shops and discard warehouses. Many items that can work as part of a medieval impression are those that hold a temporary fascination for modern people, yet often are discarded at their next change of decor. Sometimes you'll find beautiful hand-me-downs and handmade travel souvenirs or novelty items that can work. Here are a list of some common items that be can be gleaned from charity stores and either used as they are, altered slightly or taken apart and their elements used in conjunction with other things to make medieval reproductions. Wooden bowls and vessels, typology and wood variety being important to get right. Ceramic vessels, typology is again important with these, but you can sometimes find a fair stand-in for a Mayolica jug or some green glazed pottery vessels from the 1970s that might resemble a bit of green glazed ware. Glass vessels, again, typology is very tricky with these and you might not get something that's exactly the same. Woolen blankets, which are roughly equivalent to some coarse medieval twill fabrics such as flood mal. Fur coats, as a fashion historian, I personally try only to cut up fur coats that can't be revived in their original form. <laughs> However, it's up to you. Sheepskins, which can be hand washed if necessary, and fur pelts. Remnants, and lengths of brocades and damasks, which are perfect for 15th century detachable sleeves or various stars of late medieval pouches or sometimes even a whole garment, wall hangings, tablecloths, cushions, towels, napkins, etc. Silk saris, depending on the pattern, some can be used for gowns, purses or other items, but a comprehensive knowledge of textile patterns is required in order to substitute these correctly. Silk fabric, Sometimes you can find a length of silk fabric that someone's just donated um, and you can buy that for a fraction of the cost of new. Straw hats, typology is really important and those are best used in context. Wool felt hats, great for adapting to make historical styles, but remember to sanitize your second hat, hand hat purchases. Belt blanks, leather is expensive. Wool cloth pieces, suitable for small items such as hoes or hoods. Craft supplies such as yarn, needles, weaving tools like wooden shuttles, 
looms, although I personally wouldn't use obviously modern weaving tools in a display without a caveat, and preferably not at all. Modern tools can be useful at home, however, if you're weaving some medieval reproduction items. Silk ribbon for facing garment edges, such as center fronts, necklines, but buttoned cuffs, and also for styling the hair and so on. Pearls. You will need to learn how to identify real pearls. A semi-precious stone uh, piece of jewelry. That's a source of beads for paternosters and stones for other applications when doing high status impressions. You will again need a keen eye. Wooden and bone beads for paternosters. And don't buy the varnished ones or you'll be sanding forever. Rugs and mats for your camp. You will need specific knowledge, however, about the kind of rugs and mats that are appropriate to your time period. And you will need to know how to identify genuine natural fibers. Timber offcuts and timber furniture that can be adapted to a medieval shape. Uh, we've done this once or twice, so that, that can be a thing that you can do. Vintage tools such as bill hooks, mallets and so on, whatever you can find. You may actually find another reenactor's discards in a secondhand store. Treat these with caution. They would have been donated for a reason and may at best make only a temporary addition to your impression until you find something better. Typology is super important if you want to use the charity shop as a source of raw materials. If you're not selective in that process, then you will quickly start to look really Barbie, as some American Civil War reenactors say. In order to shop confidently for some of the above items, you're going to need to be able to accurately identify them. A really great trick to know when shopping for secondhand fabrics is the burn test. This is a quick and easy way to narrow, narrow down what fibre your fabric is made from. This is really important for historical reenactors because artificial regenerated fibres did not exist until the 19th century, with synthetic fibres being introduced not until the 20th century. Synthetic fibres and synthetic blends also get really sweaty and uncomfortable and are generally not an addition that will enhance your historical outfit. We are releasing with this video a short bonus video on how to identify different fibres in a burn test. Of course, there are other sources for this information and you should go there too, but this one is specially made for you history fans. Check out the link uh, down below. Another good skill to have is identifying pearls and semi-precious stones. As for identifying pearls, I found that it can take a little time to get your eye in, but after a while, you usually can identify most fakes from the real thing at a glance. Some really good fakes require handling and close examination to tell the difference. First of all, with pearl identification, let's look at uniformity. Although the pearls in a very high quality modern pearl necklace are going to be quite uniform in appearance, you are A, not very likely to find one in your local charity store and B, don't necessarily want to use really high quality uniform pearls in a medieval reproduction. What you are more likely to find in a charity store is freshwater pearls, which are usually not perfectly uniform in shape. They may have bands or pitting, bumps or ridges on the surface. Most examples of extant medieval pearl jewellery I've seen use pearls that have interesting and irregular shapes, although regular size and shape would be nice for a high status pearl paternoster. Look very closely at your pearl. The more regular its shape and surface, the more likely it is to be fake. Secondly, Real pearls have the property of reflecting light from inside of them, unlike most fake pearls, which usually seem to only have luster on the surface. On a real pearl, you can often also see a little rainbow colored effect here and there. Thirdly, on close observation of many fake pearls, you will be able to see that the hole through them has not been drilled, but molded. Sometimes you might also be able to see a line across a fake pearl where the two sides of the mold were joined together. Real pearls do not feel plasticky or too heavy and, glo and glassy, although some high quality fake pearls are made from glass. There are now some excellent fakes made from ground up mother of pearl, but I haven't come across any of those in a charity shop. 
Charity stores are getting much more savvy at identifying real jewelry from costume jewelry. So it is getting hard to find true bargains, but you can still pick up the odd piece here and there. For example, I found some lovely semi-precious stone beads strung on elastic wristbands that I intend to turn into tablet woven paternosters and medieval necklaces at my earliest opportunity. Now, as part of this video, I was going to unpack all of the items that I've thrifted and display them all together. But as I did a quick mental stock take, I quickly realized that this is going to be totally unrealistic. So I'm just going to show you now a few of my favorites. Here are the aforementioned um, semi-precious stones on an elastic wristband. I just found that in an op shop. It was five dollars or less. Um, that's like a rutilated quartz or something. So that will go really nicely into a um, a late medieval paternoster in keeping with the semi-precious stones and pearls theme. Um, this is a silk fillet that you might have seen in one of our previous uh, videos, which I tablet wove the um, fabric portion of. So I tablet wove the actual uh, band there out of silk yarn. And silk fillet is just worn on the head like that. But the, um, the pearls there that I've attached and the um, semi-precious stones, which are set in little brass collets, um, I thrifted um, in the, I think it was like the mid nineties in an op shop in my hometown. So uh, that's very far away now, um, but they've, I've kept them all this time because of the, um, the beautiful handmade workmanship there. Uh, I'll just hold that close to the camera. You can hopefully get a bit of a look at that. Again, we've got another one of those um, in a little baggie. We've got another one of those I think I've dropped some. <laughs> We've got another one of those elasticated wristbands. This time it's am <laughs> this time it's amber amber beads, which I will end up using in a paternoster. They're slightly on the small side than um, uh, the medieval um, paternoster that I would be hoping to recreate, but. Considering how much I paid for them, which was less than ten dollars, I'm calling that a success. So, yes, I've got them in the baggie with some other semi-precious stones that I would like to use them with, and I've written some notes on the bag about how I'm going to construct a paternoster, what what color of silk thread I'm going to use in the tablet weaving, and so on. <laughs> so. That's how I've decided to organize my to-do projects on the pile of shame. Here we have two little silk late medieval purses that I have handmade. Um, I'm quite proud of these because these took me what felt like years to make. Um, they took hours and hours and hours to construct. Um, I tried to be as faithful to the originals as I could be um, without having actually seen the originals in person. Um, this one here I made for my partner. Um, it is made entirely from scraps, the, the soft leather inside, I believe that's a kid leather, that's a garment weight kid leather that I purchased in a sale, a fabric sale at an old uh, workplace and um, that's beautiful, I've used that, but the one that I got from the, th um, it was an industrial discard shop, 
This is a 100% silk uh, furnishing fabric on the outside. Uh, I don't think it's a medieval style weave, unfortunately, but I, because the pattern is very similar to a 15th century silk, I decided to use it anyway uh, because I was having a really hard time sourcing these kind of fabrics at the time and I just wanted to get a reproduction purse done. So I just went ahead and used it. Um, I sourced the silk yarns that I've tablet woven and no, that's all tablet weaving. Um, all the silk yarns I sourced for the outside of the bag, um, I dyed myself. Um, and yeah, that's the story of that pouch. But um, yeah, the main body of the pouch is all from um, off cuts and second hand. The yarn was bought new and adapted. Uh, the other pouch, uh, the silk also came from the same source, like the silk fabric came from the same source as the silk fabric for this pouch. Um, it was again a 100% silk furnishing fabric um, from the same supplier and uh, I haven't lined this one, it's just the reverse side of the fabric. It's, I don't, it's not a medieval weave but the pattern was so sim similar to a late 14th century Lampus weave, um, Lampus pattern, sorry, that I decided to just go ahead and use it again for the same reasons. I just wanted to get it done. Um, I was also on a very uh, restricted budget and so voila, I got the silk yarn from a local supplier, dyed it myself, um, ditto the gold, uh, gold gimp thread. Um, yeah, there you have it. This represents, um, I don't know, I reckon you could pick up this number of wooden beads for paternosters in probably a few weeks if you put your mind to it. Um, you'll have pat paternosters forever, paternosters for your entire group. Um, <laughs> wooden beads are not difficult to come by. As I said before, don't get the varnished ones. You'll be, you'll be, uh, sand, you'll be hitting the sandpaper really hard. Um, nobody wants that. Uh, I've got a few different sizes because when you make your paternosters, you want to have two different sizes, and sometimes it's nice to have a few different colours of wood. In the next section of the video, I'd like to touch on some items you might not want to scrimp on or may need to make yourself. Shoes. What can we say about shoes? They seem to be one of the hardest items to successfully realise in a reenactor's impression. At the time of recording, there are a few suppliers available online, and I hope I won't get it myself into too much trouble here when I say that you can spend a lot or you, a little less than a lot, and your results in terms of historicity are probably going to be approximately proportional. I personally am still not entirely happy with my shoes and will continue to work on that. I think probably some of the best solutions for reenactors on a budget include the following. One, make your own. Find an historical pattern online or in a book, play around with it, buy some good leather and decent tools as cheaply as you can and have a go. I'm in the process of doing this myself and it's in the pile of shame. Two, find out lots about your historical shoes of your period of interest and try to find some reasonably priced shoes that aren't too inaccurate then you might be able to customise them to be a little better. This is what I've done so far, but I'm still not satisfied. Three, put up with modern shoes until you can save up and buy some really nice accurate shoes. Keep in mind that medieval shoes don't always last that long without special care. And in the meantime, you'll still be wearing modern shoes at events. Four, do a swap with another reenactor who makes shoes. Warning, many find that historical shoes feel very uncomfortable to wear for more than an hour or two, often because their feet are used to the extra support often by, offered by modern shoes. Some relief can be found in lining your historical shoes with a sheepskin liner or such, and some even use modern arch supports inside their historical shoes when needed. 
Take care out there, guys. Armour and arms. My partner is more an expert in this field, if you'll pardon the pun. But he says that there aren't too many ways to save money here, unless you're actually an armourer. His recommendation is that you can sometimes save money by purchasing secondhand armour from other reenactors and adapting it yourself. You would need to develop some metalworking, leatherworking and woodworking skills. You will probably need to buy some components new, such as shield bosses, buckles, spearheads, etc. As I don't do a fighting impression, I can't really advise on this topic, but I can say that not doing a fighting impression keeps me plenty busy and very engaged. I also still get to take play part in HEMA in my spare time, just not at events. Tents. Unless you have a nice period appropriate building to reenact in, you'll probably want to anachronize in a tent. I've never made a tent, but I believe that it can be done. And the cotton canvas is in fact an affordable fabric that was used in the manufacture of tents in some periods. Don't forget to waterproof it. I'm not an expert or even a beginner in this field, so I'll just leave that topic for now. Musical instruments. Anyone who has any musical knowledge or experience with early music will be able to tell you that it's mostly pretty specialised. Trying to accurately and successfully play early music for the modern ear is sure to be filled with pitfalls. I'm speaking from experience and the less said about that, the better. It's probably best to quit while one is ahead, so in conclusion I will say this. When trying to improve your impression on a tight budget, above all, use some critical analysis to assess whether the thing that you are thinking of buying is actually going to be similar to an historical item, or whether buying it will be a waste of your precious money. Is that wool blanket the right fibre, colour, weight, weave structure and size to make my 14th century mantle or early medieval rectangular cloak? If I need to make alterations to this item to make it usable, how much time and money will I really have to spend and will it add sufficient value to my impression? Would it be easier and cheaper just to buy the same sort of item or make it from scratch? These are all important considerations. To stand on my soapbox for a moment, if I may, one of my strongest personal reasons for doing reenacting and living history is to help teach people about history and to share information. So in the spirit of sharing what we have as living historians, let's not bogart the resources, but help our fellow reenactors out to improve their impressions, whatever their budget. Please feel free to share tips in the comments section down below on how to get the most out of your dollar or to brag about your best op shop finds for reenactment. As you may have heard, we're soon having a giveaway Subscribe to all platforms to win. You could have the chance to win partly these two handmade bone awls from us. As I said, subscribe to all platforms to win. Links are down below and stay tuned. Remember folks, stay safe, have fun and keep reenacting.